Let's go to God in prayer before we uh, open up the book of Philemon. And uh, Our God and our Father, we are grateful to you today for the time that we have to come together. We are thankful for the fellowship that we have amongst the brotherhood of your people. We're thankful for the ability we have to read your word, to explore it together, and the freedom we have to do so without fear. We're thankful for the encouragement that we get from being around your people, being a part of your body. We're thankful for the recognition that we are not alone when we go into this world striving to be and to live a life that is so typically counter to the way in which our world lives. We're thankful for the camaraderie that we have amongst those who believe and strive to live in the same way. God, I pray that your spirit would be present among us this morning as we open your word and explore what it is that you would have us to learn today about who we should be and how we can better be your people, be a better reflection of your nature and your character to the world in which we live. And but God, we don't, we don't want to just leave those things here in this place, but, but I pray that your spirit would be powerfully present in our lives as we leave this place, that we would have the wisdom and the discernment to hear your voice calling to us and that we would have the boldness to follow where you lead and the courage to be your ambassadors and your witnesses in this world. We thank you for Jesus, the unity we have in his blood and the hope we have in his sacrifice. And we ask these things in his name. Amen. Let's go ahead and... Uh, Philemon is a hard book to find. There you go, right before Hebrews. One little page. But some really deep and rich lessons we learn from this little book of Philemon. So we're going to look at uh, Philemon the first half uh, this morning. We're going to look at the second half uh, next week as we look at what it means to be reconciled in Christ. That's what, the, it's what we find here in the book of Philemon. We have this... Uh, Slave, he's called a slave of, uh, of, or Onesimus is called a slave of Philemon. And, you know, we'll talk about that language here in a minute. It's something that maybe we struggle with a little bit because of our understanding of that slave, uh, the context of our, of our culture, you know, where we hear about slaves. We have difficulty when we hear other people talking about it, like in Scripture, and like, what does that mean? We'll explore that relationship a little bit, and, and some of the things Onesimus might have done to violate this relationship with Philemon. But Onesimus was uh, now a servant of God, but previously he had been a servant of Philemon. And something transpired in this relationship, and so he had done something wrong against Philemon, and ran away. And Paul encounters Philemon, as Phile or encounters Onesimus as Philemon is... I'm going to get these backwards, I can tell. It's been one of those weeks. My mind is kind of uh, foggy in the moment. Um, Paul meets Onesimus as he's running away from Philemon. And he encourages Onesimus to go back to Philemon. And of course, as you can imagine, if you've done something wrong to someone, I don't know if you have ever wronged someone or ever had a disagreement with someone. Um, but running right back to those people that I've done something wrong to may not be high on my list of priorities, depending on how egregious my error was against those people. But yet Paul says, I want you to go back, but that's okay. You're going to be okay because I know Philemon. I know Philemon well. He's a brother of mine, and now so are you. And so I'm going to write you a letter to take back with you. And so before he says anything, you're going to ask him to read this letter from me. Maybe that made it a little easier for Onesimus uh, to go back to Philemon. And let's read the first 11 verses of, of this here. Uh, the letter begins this way. He says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker. To Aphia, our sister, Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home, grace and peace to you from God our Father. And from the Lord Jesus Christ, 
I always thank my God when I mention you in my prayers uh, because I hear of your love and faith towards the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. I pray that your participation in the faith may become effective through knowing every good thing that is in us for the glory of Christ. For I have great joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. For this reason, I have great boldness in Christ to command you to do what is right. I appeal to you instead on the basis of love. I, Paul, as an elderly man and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus, appeal to you for my son Onesimus. I fathered him while I was in chains. Once he was useless to you, but now he is useful both to you and to me. So, you know, right off the bat, we kind of see exactly why this letter is being written to Philemon. And then the lesson we learn from this is much the same, that when we have conflict with others, we will show love and forgiveness. Um, that's just the, the basic fundamental understanding of what it is to live in Christ, to be a Christian, that along with that comes a different kind of love in the world that we live in knows, a different kind of forgiveness in the world that we live in knows. I want you to go back and think. You know, I asked that question just a moment ago. Have you ever had a disagreement with someone? Did a particular disagreement pop into your mind? Have you ever had a falling out with someone so, so deep and so powerful of a disagreement that it completely tore your relationship apart? It happens on many different levels in our lives, doesn't it? It happens with... It happens with us when we're young. It happens with us when we are old. It happens sometimes with families. It happens with people that have spent most of their lives together at times. We have those things that transpire in our lives. And, and, and at times it, it separates relationships at its very core. We're, we're not very good about going back and asking for forgiveness. We're not really good at being in Philemon's place either. I don't know what transpired exactly between Philemon and Onesimus, but, but it was enough that Onesimus said, I can't stay here, I've got to go, and so he runs away. And it was enough that in order for Philemon to take him back, it needed a special letter from Paul to say, listen, you need to take him back. And Paul uses a kind of writing here that is, that is really powerful and persuasive. I appeal to you on the basis of love. He's going to say some things that are a little more persuasive, uh, and we'll talk about that next week as he gets into a kind of rhetoric that says, basically, you owe me this. You think Onesimus has wronged you, and you think you have something over him? Don't you remember what I've done for you? And, and so there is this appeal. He says, I appeal to you on the basis of love. Onesimus was once useless to you. But now, not only is he useful to you, he is useful to both you and me. How easy is it to approach the people who we have wronged? How easy is it for us to see those people coming who have wronged us and be willing to receive them back into our lives? But Paul asks Philemon to see Onesimus in the same way. He says, in the same way that you see me, I am sending you back a brother. Onesimus is a changed man. It doesn't, it doesn't excuse what he did. It doesn't mean that, that there isn't still a, a price or a penalty to pay. It doesn't mean that there aren't still maybe some consequences for the actions that he had. But he says, Onesimus came to me, a stranger. And he is leaving a brother and a son in Christ. He said, and much like Christ has done for you, all of the things that are in Onesimus' past need to be left in his past. They are a part of the old man that Onesimus once was, but he is now one of us. The encouragement for Philemon, nay, the command is to receive Onesimus back. Not to receive his place back as a servant, as a slave, as an employee but as a member of the household. 
There's a powerful request that Paul gives to Onesimus here. I love the way Paul begins with these prayers, though. Don't you, in all of his letters, almost all of his letters, I hear of your love and your faithfulness towards Jesus and towards all the saints. I pray that the participation in the faith may become effective through, et, through knowing every good thing that is in us for the glory of Christ. For I have great joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. Is Paul buttering up Philemon? Maybe a little bit, but he means what he says. It's not um, disingenuous. Paul is reminding Philemon of the man that he is in Christ Jesus. And then he's going to say, and because this is the man that you are, you have an obligation to forgive the man that I'm sending back your way. Because just like he has an obligation to make this right with you, you have an obligation to receive him and recognize what it is to live in love and forgiveness. Because by the way, this man who you sent to me is going to be a powerful worker for you and a powerful worker for me. And a powerful worker for the kingdom. Yes, I need him here, but it is more important that the two of you become reconciled because you are now brothers. And brothers cannot have this thing between them when they are united in Christ. The gospel brings reconciliation in his people. The other thing that I think we see here, especially as we look at the life of Onesimus and Philemon, is that you have a witness. And you have a testimony to proclaim to the world. And, and that testimony, that witness extends beyond the words that you will say or the education that you've received. You know, sometimes we say, you know, I don't know how I can really be effective about reaching people for the gospel because I just don't know that much. I'm not educated like a lot of people. They use big, heavy words that we don't really understand and concepts that we can't fully grasp. And they're just smarter than me. Maybe I'll leave it to them. But that's not what telling people about the gospel of Jesus is all about. And, and, and maybe it's just that I don't have the words to speak or to say that when I get in front of people, I just got to clam up. You know, I sent a message to Kyle. And that's the message he sent back here the other day. He said, I will do anything for you in service as long as it doesn't include standing up in front of people and talking. He looked at me and he said, look, I can, I can speak to anybody one-on-one. -on -one. I've been with Kyle one-on-one. -on -one. I've seen the way he can um, sell a house. I can see the way he can have a relationship immediately with people. But he says, get in front. He said, it wouldn't be good. Wouldn't be good for any of us if I got up there in front of folks. I don't know if that's true, but that's his perception. We get that way with the gospel sometimes. Don't we? It's like, well, I'm going to leave the evangelism to other people because they can speak better. They're better with their words. They know the answers. We have all kinds of ways that we witness. What do you do in your life? Are you a mother? A father? A friend? A husband or a wife? Are you a co-worker? Are you an accountant? Are you a scientist? Law enforcement officer? Lawyer? Garbage collector? Janitor? Servant? You know, whatever it is that you are doing, if you are a Christian, you aren't just those things. You are a Christian one of those things. And if the people around you know that you are a Christian one of those things, that should shape the way they expect you to behave. If they know anything about what it means to be Christian. You know, I, I told Dustin when he left for the Marine Corps, he, I said, look, I said, they want to make you into a Marine. That's fine. But don't let them take who you are. Because I promise you this, they may make you into a good Marine, but if you can be a Christian Marine, you will be better than anything they can create you to be. They don't know what integrity is because integrity in the Marine Corps is nothing compared to integrity in God and in Christ. 
And if you can be a Christian first and allow them to give you all the skills that a Marine needs, you will be a better Marine than you could ever be on your own. Because being a Christian anything just amplifies all of the good that is instilled in us in those moments. Being a Christian employer means that that our employees should expect something different of us. Being a, a Christian employee should mean that our employers can expect something different from us because we claim Christ as Lord. And that in and of itself, the way that we work, the way that we live, the way that we talk, the way that we interact, the way that we engage, the way that we love, the way that we serve, is your testimony. And we must allow it to be a testimony, not just a good work that falls on deaf ears. We've been looking in Genesis on Wednesday nights, and one of the things that we see, and and we see this kind of in person here with Philemon and Onesimus, is that when sin entered the world, it didn't only impact our relationship with God. Like our relationship, our human relationships, our relationships with, with nature, our relationships with one another, every aspect of our lives has been affected by sin. And Paul says, Onesimus has become my son. We were in chains together, and Onesimus has become my son. His life has changed. I have witnessed his change of heart. He says, I need you to see that change as well. Genesis chapter 3, in verse 16, we see the way it, it impacts our relationship. He said to the woman, I will intensify your labor pains. You will bear children in anguish. Your desire will be for your husband. And he will rule over you. See, because sin enters the world, things are more difficult between a husband and between a wife. Between brothers. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 8, Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out in the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. See, when sin entered, it it affected every aspect of our lives. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5, we see yet another aspect of sin. He said, when the Lord saw that man's wickedness was widespread on the earth and that every scheme his mind thought of was nothing but evil all the time. When sin comes in and when it is left unchecked, it just pervades everything. We also see that even, even the earth suffered because of the entrance of sin. And Paul talks about all creation groaning for the restoration of all things in God. But Christ came and gave his sacrifice so that we could make ourselves back to God and back to one another. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32, he says, And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. Right? That because of what Jesus has done, there is something different about the way we are to live as Christians. And we are to be a people who, just like our Savior, are to pursue reconciliation. To be reconciled. To be reconciled to one another. To be reconciled to God. To continuously seek out the ways in which we can provide pathways back to God. Not to push people further away. Not to divide and to split And to place obstacles in the paths of people. But to find those ways in which our witness and our testimony can point people towards God. And bring him glory and bring him honor. 